Well, thanks for the kind of introduction. And I'd like to um, give you guys a flavor of some of the things that we were doing at, or that we've experienced at uh, GSK. Um, so just sort of a, a brief overview. Um, I'll be talking about uh, anti-drug antibody assays that we are using in, in the clinic. Um, give you an idea of the format, um, some interference that we experienced, and uh, two particular approaches that we used to um, try and eliminate it, and then do a little review of uh, assay cut points and then some regulatory feedback. So anti-drug antibody assays, it's sort of a tiered approach. You have a screening assay to try and reduce the number of samples that then go on to your confirmatory assay. And those that then confirm positive, that's what gets reported to the regulatory agent agencies, and those are further characterized with a, a titer assay to give you an idea of what the, uh, the relative uh, response is. Um, one of the, sort of the ADA results are, are never standalone. Um, it's all sort of results. You always have to look at those in context to either um, PK results or the clinical observations. And as was mentioned before, um, if you develop a binding antibody, that may sort of speed up the clearance, or you may have a sustaining antibody response. And so the ADA result could help uh, sort of explain aberrant observations in a, a PK profile. And similarly for the, uh, the clinical observations, if your patients have loss of efficacy or you start seeing some uh, adverse or serious adverse events, uh, ADAs may be able to help explain that. So the primary format that, that we're currently using is a uh, bridging assay format. And it basically uses the drug as both the capture and also the detection probe. So here we have the, the biotinylated and the ruthenylated, and you've sort of formed this, this bridge. And it's bound to a streptavid encoded plate. Uh, we use the MSD format. And it's from a sort of a bench approach. It's very simple. There are very few wash steps. Um, and what's nice is that there's uh, high drug tolerance and also um, very good uh, uh, sensitivity for this assay. One of the caveats, so there's several, but one of them is that the assumption is that you have a, uh, a bivalent uh, antibody, so the IgG4 um, wouldn't work with this particular approach. So the assay was validated, transferred to a CRO, and used in a clinical trial. Um, and we had sort of a 63% positive rate. Um, I guess let me. So the screening cut point was um, done during validation with a, a commercially sourced um, disease population. And we had 1.22 relative ECL, so that's normalized to the, uh, the NC pool. So we had a pretty high um, screening positive rate, and then of those, you know, the confirmed positive was 26%, um, which is pretty high. Um, there was no sort of aberrant PK results. Patients seemed to tolerate pretty well. So it was, although the results were high, um, it did sort of raise a little flag that maybe something's up with the assay, but it wasn't worth uh, sort of redesigning it at that point. Um, then in the, the second clinical trial, we had 50% positive rate, and then of those, 95% of the screen positives confirmed positives. So 45% po positive rate is, I guess somebody had mentioned a 40% threshold, um, is, is really high, um, which suggests that maybe the drug's not very good. Um, but it was well tolerated in the clinic and seemed to be very efficacious. Um, and so, Luckily for, well, at least in, this, in the second clinical, or, yeah, so when you looked at the confirmed positive samples and did the, the titer analysis, almost all of them were really low, um, which suggests that although there is some type of ADA response, um, it wasn't really that dramatic. Um, you do have some higher ones, you know, 164, 128, but most of them were on the lower side. So one caveat with this sort of bridging assay is that um, although the, um, the, the targeted bridge is, is sort of this, your anti-drug antibody binding your, your two conjugated um, drugs to form your bridge, if your antibody binds to other things, for example, a multivalent target, or you could also have um, membrane-bound targets and with 
cellular fragments present in the serum, you will get um, a false uh, bridge, but it still presents itself as a, um, a positive uh, ADA result. Um, so in our case, we did look for target interference. Um, and as you can see, there's almost sort of a, a linear response. With more target, you do get um, a signal. And then in the presence of drug, the drug basically neutralizes the target and there's no interference. So we sort of knew from um, normal subjects that their um, endogenous level was really low. Uh, it was actually below the cut point. And with diseased individuals, um, they had, they had five-fold more, but it was also still below the, uh, the diseased uh, cut point. And so we really didn't sort of anticipate that this would be an issue. Um, luckily, in the, the second uh, clinical trial, they, they did do a, a biomarker assay for the target to show uh, target engagement. And as you can see here, this is a, sort of a snapshot of the exit visit, that in the placebo group, um, sort of the endogenous level was below or BLQ. 95% um, of the subjects were in that range. You do have some sort of individuals that had, did have high levels of the, uh, the target, um, but most of them were below the, uh, the detection limit. Um, what was interesting for this particular case was that for those individuals that were dosed, that basically um, there was a 100-fold increase in the, the target. And so, in this case, the, the drug actually um, bound the target and then prevented its natural uh, catabolism. And so you had these high levels then remained as long as the drug was around. So this, was, um, this sort of offered us a, a lead in that these, this high level of, of target was probably causing our, our uh, interference. So we sort of approached or used two different methods to try and eliminate this, this target interference. One was amino target depletion, another one was an amino target uh, competition. <laughs> so I'll present those. Um, so the idea with the, um, the amino target depletion was that you'd have um, an antibody that was specific to the target um, bound to a solid phase. And so we screened a uh, sort of this is a, the assay format that we use to screen the antibodies. Um, they're either could or on a um, microtide well plate or they're biotinylated. And then we added both uh, target and drug to see um, what type of interference there was. So that you're incubated with the antibody. The solution was then added to the, removed from the well and then added to the, uh, the conjugates to see if we were able to detect the, uh, the target. So in screening, uh, both in-house and commercial antibodies, polyclonal, monoclonal, biotinylated. Um, in the presence of target, there is, you know, significant signal, um, for example, in the polyclonals. Once you get to the monoclonals, they, you started seeing some, some differences. And when you added the drug, basically the drug bound the target and then that got carried over into your assay and caused the interference. And so we wanted to to avoid that. And so there were basically two candidates that um, the drug didn't interfere and it, there was a dramatic decrease in the, the target interference. Um, of these two, we opted for the biotinylated one, partly because um, we didn't want um, the antibody to be carried over into subsequent uh, assays, or the subsequent uh, steps. So that was the one we selected. Um, in creating sort of some mock samples, both in regards to various drug target and PC concentrations. Um, you can see here, so this, these are the, um, so the, the relative ECLs of the, um, the samples in, without this sort of uh, solid phase extraction of the target. And on the, the very right, you, you have the, uh, the target being, being removed and so here there's a dramatic drop, you re bring it back to the, the background. Um, similarly for the positive control, you basically get similar response. When you start making combinations of the, um, these, when you have dry, um, target plus PC, you sort of get an, an additive effect. And then when you do the, the, ex the uh, immuno um, target depletion, it then uh, basically looks just like um, the PC by itself. And so you've completely removed the, uh, the target interference. 
Um, when drugs on board, the drug's going to bind the target, so you're going to get a slightly um, lower um, assay response. But when you do the uh, immune target depletion, it basically goes back down to background, which is also the goal. Um, and then the final combination, the positive control will bind the drug, so you're going to get a, a lower um, response due to the positive control. And then similarly, when you add the, um, the target, it's going to be a little less, but it then gets depleted. The target gets depleted, and you can um, <coughs> detect all of your initial positive control. Um, the second approach was to use the, uh, the immuno uh, target competition. And in this case, the, um, the antibody is added as part of your diluent and then is present throughout the, uh, the analysis process. And so here we used a different type of screening approach, and it was to um, biotinylate the target and then do a relative competition between the sort of, I guess, candidate antibodies and the, uh, the ruthenylated drug. And you're trying here. You're trying to find uh, antibody that has uh, a higher affinity for the target than the, uh, or similar to the to the drug. So there are two potential um, sort of outcomes. One is your your blocking antibody has a, a, a higher affinity for the target, and therefore you don't see any signal. Or if there's no affinity for this particular candidate, then the drug is going to bind, and you'll see a, a very large signal. So when we screened various antibodies, the, the overall responses did, uh, did vary. Um, some had uh, basically no impact um, in regards to um, interfering or preventing the, the drug from binding its target. Um, we did have one that, that worked very well. Um, and so that was the, uh, the one that was chosen to go forward. So in adding um, the, uh, this antibody to the, uh, the solution, we needed to sort of um, fine tune the assay a little. And one was the, uh, the incubation time of the blocking antibody to give it a chance to um, bind to the, uh, the target um, before we added the conjugates. And so for the most part, one hour was enough. Um, but in some cases, it was beneficial to go out for a little longer. So we opted for three hours. And then in the other variable was what kind of concentration do we want to, to use to try and block this interference? And um, in trying various antibody concentrations, uh, 50 seemed to work the best. So that's what we opted to, to use. So um, in creating some uh, sort of mock samples, here we have sort of very high uh, responses, and in using the blocking antibody, we were able to dramatically reduce the, uh, the interference from this, um, with this, um, the, this blocking antibody. Um, right here, this was sort of our, our, our key indicator. Um, this is about twice what we had expected in our, in our clinical trial. And, and so it was able to reduce something that had a 15 relative ECL interference um, down to, to background. And then when we looked at the, both the, the NC and the positive control, there was no um, uh, interference from adding this blocking antibody to uh, the, the positive control detection. So just sort of a quick recap. Um, the samples initially get diluted, and then in the immunodepletion, we have uh, an anti-target antibody that's bound to a, um, in this case, we did use um, a cephros resin to remove the target, uh, that gets centrifuged, and then the supernatant gets added to the, the drug conjugates. In the second scenario, we did the in-solution um, anti-target antibody, and basically it did have its um, separate incubation, but then it gets carried all, all the way to the, uh, the MSD uh, well. Um, so here we wanted to actually try this, the, these two approaches on, the, um, on clinical samples. And so here you sort of have a broad distribution of um, samples. And in, the, um, in using the immune target depletion, where we did sort of the solid phase extraction, um, there was a, a dramatic decrease in regards to the number of samples that uh, were high positives. Um, you did have some on the higher end. Um, 
but the one that seemed to work really was the most efficient was having the um, this blocking antibody present in the solution during the the whole assay, and that's um, this right here. So that um, sort of additional step was was added. We then uh, revalidated the assay. So in the middle, you have the sort of our general conditions for the assay. You still have low sensitivity. It did require an extra dilution in adding the, the blocking antibody, uh, but the sensitivity didn't really change that much. The, um, the normal uh, cut point variability went down a little, but uh, still was, was pretty similar. Um, and then confirmation, we, at this point, we were using a, um, a confirmation assay where you spiked at a low level, so you're taking, you're shooting for like um, relative ECL of, of two, and you're trying to look for the, the decrease in signal um, due to the added drug. Um, and the other key part is the, uh, the drug interference, and the drug interference did go down a little, but it was still acceptable to, to our criteria. Um, when the samples were reanalyzed from the, the second study, um, in parentheses you have the original, and then afterwards there's a, the number of um, positive samples went down quite a bit. And the biggest impact had to do with the, uh, the, conf the confirmatory assay where we went from 45% to 1%. Um, and so this, um, by adding the, the blocking antibody, uh, had a Right, had a big impact in our assay and also got rid of the, the false positive rate. And then when we looked at the titers of the, um, the various the positive samples, the overall um, number went from 45 percent to, to one, so the total number is, has decreased. We still had a number of individuals that were, you know, four or below, sort of relatively low um, titers, but the high ones still remained. Um, so, um, here, so this assay was then used on subsequent uh, clinical trials. Um, the number two, that was using the, um, the, the older, um, sort of, without the, the blocking antibody. And as you can see, um, total variability was higher. Uh, it wasn't normal, so we had to do a log transformation. Um, and it also had a, a slightly higher cut point. Once we introduced the blocking antibody, um, they were all sort of normally distributed, um, and the cut points were all relatively low. Um, and actually, they were very similar to what was um, observed in the, during validation. And so in some ways, um, all this sort of additional analysis for these um, both New indicate or different indications and additional studies. Um, it was it was a lot of work to <laughs> basically confirm that the um, the cut point that we had determined in validation was was um, in the correct range. Um, and I think that there is some discussion of trying to sort of set a um, a confidence limit or a constant co confidence level on what is determined in validation. That if you have a mean that's um, sort of acceptable from your predose individuals that you don't have to go and redo a, uh, an in-study cut point. When we look at the actual uh, results, overall, the, um, here we have the, the cut points. The uh, number of positive samples was in the 20 to 30 range, a little higher than what we had seen before, um, but it did reduce the number of samples that ended up going to confirmation. And the biggest impact was that the number of confirmed positives was were in the two to two, two to four percent. Um, so, in, in redoing this this assay, it really came down to the, the confirmation assay, and you are adding drug to try and sort of see the change in in the interference of the assay. Um, one of the requirements is that you have you're looking for one percent po uh, false positive rate, and although the original sort of assay did have a PC spike, the new FDA requirements uh, want to look at basically the noise. And so our SOPs have been revised to, to use that going uh, uh, forward. Um, the confirmation assay also, you're trying to get rid of any target interference. Um, and 
For the confirmation assay, it also depends on what your, your therapeutic is. Um, in this case, it was a, a monoclonal antibody, but if you have a, um, a linker with a drug or um, a carrier protein, your confirmation assays can get very complicated looking at those various uh, components. And yeah, the assay tries to give you data to explain your, your PK and uh, serious adverse events. So in looking at all the, the, the positive samples, um, there is sort of this classification of uh, transient and persistent antibody responses. So a transient antibody response is a, um, a single positive result that then the subsequent um, time points are negative. And the uh, persistent antibody response is one that either the last time point is positive, so you don't really know what's going on or what may happen next, or during your, your clinical trial it's positive and it remains uh, positive. And what I found sort of interesting in looking at the overall distribution is that the transient um, titers from the, those individuals was similar to those that had a persistent uh, response. Um, I was sort of anticipating a, sort of a, a bigger difference, but they seem to be um, pretty close. You do have some that are, that are a little higher, um, but the, that were the persistent. Um, and then when you look at it a slightly different way, sort of from the, the relative ECLs, that in the transient population, you can have, for example, um, you know, relative ECL of three, but that's not really predictive of what the titer is going to be. Um, you can have, you know, for some individuals it's a titer of two, some other individuals, you know, you may have to go out, to, um, in this case, six-fold uh, dilution to try and get the, uh, the response below uh, background. And for those subjects with the, the persistent response, it was also similar. You do get some, some higher uh, relative ECLs, um, but you do, it, the relative ECL isn't predictive of what the, the titer is going to be. And so this sort of brings um, back to how the, um, where you really have to then look at uh, the individual subject, um, because you're looking at, you need to look at what's going on with that subject. Is there a boosting of the, um, the ADAs within their various time um, points? And the other sort of key aspect of the sort of trying to classify something as persistent is that if you just have, um, you know, your exit or your, your follow-up, having additional sort of a time point after that would really confirm whether you're seeing a, a true ADA response or you're just seeing some type of interference. So the assays were submitted to the, uh, the regulatory agencies and they had a sort of a number of um, questions. Um, they wanted to know, you know, what the positive control was, how it was characterized, um, whether it was an IgM or IgG. I, um, in, the, in our validation re report, we didn't really go into how the MRD was characterized. I mean, it was done in method development, so we had to sort of supply that data. Um, the drug tolerance, of course, is um, important for an ADA assay since you're using both a drug capture and a drug um, detection probe. And um, there they wanted to make sure that um, there was a sufficient uh, tolerance so that, that you could actually believe the, uh, the results. And in our case, even with the the newer um, sort of FDA requirements of a sensitivity of around 100 nanograms per mil PC, uh, we still had sufficient uh, drug tolerance with this assay. Another sort of component was robustness. Um, in our case, it had been transferred to two different CROs. You used different MSD plates, different uh, instruments, um, and the assay was very robust. Another concern was the critical reagents. Um, you make a batch conjugates, they run out. How are you going to ensure that uh, you're going to have sort of continuity from um, at least you try to plan it so that there are enough reagents, at least within a clinical trial, that there aren't any changes. Uh, but we do have a, an SOP that allows us to sort of bridge uh, one batch to, a, to another. And probably the, the most um, Important was the conjugation process. Um, 
it's easy to, to sort of go to a higher sort of molar ratios. Um, you get great responses. But the danger is that if you overconjugate your uh, drug target or your drug, that you'll actually mask uh, epitopes. And so um, there during our development, we did actually what the, was recommended by the manufacturer, and then we did a, above and below, and then used those um, products to try and optimize an assay for the signal to noise based on our positive control. Um, for an antibody, it's pretty large, so it's a little less critical, but for um, smaller um, drugs, it becomes a, a bigger concern and to the point that most of, at least the R chemistry, we use the NHS chemistry, going after amines. With um, smaller drugs, it may be worthwhile considering using um, the carboxylate uh, conjugates so that you, you have uh, free amines available to, uh, as a potential epitope for the, uh, the ADAs. So just sort of to, to recap, um, in our case, the target did cause a, a large um, percentage of false positives during our, our clinical trials. And we tried two different approaches, and the, uh, the in-solution or the block, uh, blocking antibody um, had the biggest impact in reducing these um, false positives and uh, greatly improved our uh, confirmation assay. And the, yeah, the, although a lot of effort is put on the screening, it's really the confirmation assay that's probably the most critical because that's what's being reported to the uh, regulatory agencies. And then these are the, the people that were involved. And I'd like to thank you. Thank you for your time. Time for questions. Wow, I'll answer them all. Okay. Right. Uh, one, one quick thing just going from my mind, which was um, towards the beginning of the talk when you were introducing about the, the second set of studies with the, the competition approach. Um, I guess when you when you see the, the high level of response. Um, you know, when you first of all screen the clinical samples, and I'm, I'm not a sort of an expert in this area, but how how do you then particularly understand that these are sort of false positive <coughs> responses rather than something which is a sort of genuine? Uh, this is a more sort of basic you know, question, you, but right. I mean, you you assume that the assay is working correctly and that there are ADAs present. Mm -hmm. um, it's difficult to sort of assume that you know there's some interference, and so it, you, the clincher really was showing that. There were, there was the clinical trial where we looked at the uh, the target levels in all the subjects, and so that was um, sort of the flag saying mm -hmm. we see this huge increase in target, um, and it's only in dose subjects; it's not yeah. in the placebo. Yeah. Um, so that was really the only way to, to yeah, know. Sense, yeah. um, Great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Thank you.